All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Stephen Sparks, uh, the owner of Point Reyes Books, and I'm really fortunate to be joined here tonight by Hugh Raffles, um, who is joining us from Manhattan. So it's a little later for him than it is for us. Um, so Hugh, thanks for staying up with us tonight. <laughs> to talk about this amazing book. Um, before we get started on our conversation, I just wanted to mention a few upcoming things and, and a few things about the platform we're using tonight. Crowdcast, um, there's a chat function, which I think many of you have already seen and, and have commented on. Um, so please feel free to say hi in there. And uh, there's an ask question function, uh, function down at the bottom right next to the chat box as well. Um, I would like, and so feel free to do that. Okay, I'm just double checking a couple things here. Uh, the event is recording, so if, if you, for some reason, if it cuts out or if you have to run, you can join in basically right after the event. The, the replay will be live right here on Crowdcast. Um, and at some point, we, we hope to be able to upload to YouTube. Um, I, I think Hugh is going to have a lot of really kind of profound things to say if this book is any indication. And so um, I, I know as, a, as sort of a moderator, and even sometimes when I just do the introduction, I have a hard time actually kind of taking it all in. So I've, I've watched, rewatched several of these and I have, I have a stack of notes here next to me from these events and, um, and I look forward to doing that after this event as well. A couple of quick upcoming event notes. Um, tomorrow night at seven o'clock right here on Crowdcast, we're hosting Terry Tempest Williams. She'll be talking about um, erosion, her uh, essay collection, as well as a really profound and moving piece that she recorded for the New York Times Daily um, called Obituary for the Land, which is about the wildfires that, of course, are affecting all of us in the West um, and blowing smoke to the East Coast. Just the enormity of these things is almost uh, incomprehensible. Um, other events besides these three that I'll mention are on our website, so you can always check there. On November 19th, we're, we're hosting a panel discussion um, on the work of Charles Bowden, um, great sort of complicated Southwestern writer, um, and we'll have uh, panelist information on that soon. So please mark your calendar. That'll be a pretty special occasion. And then on December 10th, we're hosting Ken Lane, uh, we'll keep with the desert, the Southwest team. Ken, Ken Lane is the, the creator of the Desert Oracle, the sort of cult, culty, mysterious uh, pamphlet publication, quarterly publication that comes out of Joshua Tree, and he writes about kind of lost histories and UFO sightings and, and you know, mysteries of the Mojave. So Ken will be joining us in what promises to be a really fun evening. Um, and with without any further ado, then we'll, we'll move on from that. But like I said, you can keep on, keep up with our newsletter. If you're here, I, I suspect you've already um, figured out how to keep in touch with us, so thanks for that. I'm going to introduce Hugh Raffles, whose biography is the is the best biography I've I've come across recently, at least in any of these events that I've done, because it tells us that Hugh Raffles grew up in London. Um, he has been an ambulance driver, a nightclub DJ, a theater technician, a busboy, a cleaner, and a scrap metal yard worker. Uh, Hugh now lives in New York City and is a professor of anthropology at the New School. His first book, uh, In Amazonia, A Natural History, which I have here, but I was telling Hugh right before I spilled a bunch of water all over. So In Amazonia has maybe appropriately been baptized right before this event. <laughs> um, was awarded the Victor Turner Prize for ethnographic writing. Um, and his second uh, book, Insectopedia, which is incredible as well, I'll hold that up here, um, was a New York Times notable book and won several awards, including the Orion, Orion Book Prize. Um, with that, I want to introduce you. Um, Hugh, would you like to read the prologue from, from the Book of Unconformities, which if you haven't seen it already, it's a beautiful package. Um, it's It really feels appropriate to the kind of labor that went into this. Um, and I so appreciate you joining us, Hugh. And if you want to read, we can jump into questions after that. That, that sounds great. And Stephen, thank you very much for inviting me to come here and do this. And I'm, I'm very grateful to, to be able to do that, um, to talk and talk about my book. And very happy other people are here too. So this is great. Thank you. Um, so let me, let, me, let me start now, just um, read the prologue, as you say. In December 1994, my youngest sister, Frankie, died unexpectedly in Edinburgh, hemorrhaging during childbirth while giving birth to twins. Three months later, my eldest sister, Sally, killed herself near London, carefully stuffing the exhaust pipe of her car. Soon after, I started reaching for rocks, stones, and other seemingly solid objects as anchors in a world unmoored. Ways to make sense of these events through stories far larger than my own, Stories that started in the most fundamental and speculative histories, geological, archaeological, 
histories before history, and opened unmistakably into absences that echo in the world today. Absences not only mineral, but human and animal, and occasionally vegetable too. Geologists call a discontinuity in the deposition of sediment an unconformity. It's a physical representation of a gap in the geological record, a material sign of a break in time, readily readable once you know where and how to look. The most famous is Hutton's Unconformity at Sicker Point near Edinburgh, to which in June 1788, the physician geologist James Hutton rode out with his friends, John Playfair and James Hall, to demonstrate the fact of deep time, that the earth, contrary to the wisdom of the day, was far more than 6,000 years old, that in fact, as Hutton later wrote so beguilingly, it showed no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. An unconformity such as Hutton's, with its uptilted and eroded grey whack, resting directly below the more horizontal layer of gently sloping, sloping red sandstone laid down 65 million years later, is both a seam and a rupture, a juxtaposition that reveals a cleft that can't be closed. After my sisters died, I was preoccupied by the standing stones at Callanish, the famous Neolithic monument on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. Frankie had lived beside these stones for several years in the 1970s, and they towered over my memories of her. Four years older than me, by her early 20s, my sister had staked out her place on the planet, a chain smoking, back to the earth, queer feminist photographer, a bundle of contradictions like most of us, and a powerful force in my life. Frankie had little interest in the Kalanish stones and scorned for the people who made the journey so far north to see them. But I was young enough to be susceptible to all experience and would climb the hill behind her house to walk among the monoliths, touch their surfaces and strain to understand them. It was only many years later in June 2010 that I rode the ferry across the Minch to Stornoway and drove up to Kalanay, as it was now known, one of several journeys in northern landscapes that are in the book encounters with people, places, and things, which helped me recognize that although my sister's deaths were only minor horrors in the history of the world, for those closest to them, even minor horrors transform all that follows. But the world's great horrors too are composed of personal loss and unresolved grief. That even the most solid, ancient, and elemental materials are as lively, capricious, willful, and indifferent as time itself, and that life is filled with unconformities revealing holes in time that are also fissures in feeling, knowledge and understanding. Holes that relentlessly draw in human investigation and imagination, yet refuse to conform, heal or submit to explanation in ways we might desire or think we need. Sometimes the gaps are too wide, the people, the animals, the objects, the worlds too gone, the time too much for the little time we have. Adrift on a sleepless night, it can feel vertiginous, an abyss of infinity, but then I leave my apartment and head down to the packed morning subway and rattle along below Broadway, crammed between all these New York bodies, all this human warmth and possibility, this intimate, reassuring connection to the city and the planet and to everything and to all of us passing through. And you know, I think when I read that, I think, well, yeah, when I wrote that, that was before COVID, so you could do that. You could get on the subway, you could be around people, you could like enjoy the experience of being, you know, crushed in with people. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a, I, I wanted to ask, you know, so this book came out and, and we're still obviously in the thick of this, if it if it's caused, you know, given you any sort of reason for reflection on, on both the way that the book works and, and moves and, and the way that you move through the book. I mean, this is a book of journeys in a way. And, yeah. You know, um, yeah. No, I have thought a lot about that and, you know, wondered, I mean, so much of this, yeah, a lot of the book and the way that I've worked for a long time has been, has been through travel going places. I mean, because I'm, because I work professionally as an anthropologist, you know, a lot of what I've done is go places, meet people, talk to them, spend time with them. Um, and that's just been impossible for the past, well, well now, since March at least. Um, and even just the sort of, you know, serendipitous meeting people and just having conversations with them is just something which just, you know, I mean, we, we all have this experience. Um, so yeah, I've reflected a lot on this and, you know, and about what, you know, having to rethink the way that I write and the way that I research. But, you know, honestly, I think like a lot of people, I have no idea what that means and where, it, where it's going. 
and what will come out of it. And partly I think it's because of the situation of uncertainty that we're, we're, we're all in, you know, not knowing what this is going to look like, even though we, I think we all know it's not going to look like exactly what it was, but we don't really know what it will be. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, something in that in the prologue that kind of carries throughout is this idea of an unconformity. And maybe you can just give a brief kind of thumbnail sketch of what an unconformity is. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I mean, a gap, uh, an unconformity is a, is a gap in the geological record. I mean, it's the point at which two layers of two layers of rock from different and uh, non-sequential time meet, um, and. So you could think of it, I think, as a as a hole in time. It's it's you know. So you might want to read rocks, you know, um, through their layers and through their stratigraphy. But this is these are layers which don't really belong together, or they indicate there's something missing. So for me, it became, you know, it, it became a metaphor really, um, both you know very material. So, um, but also a metaphor for just for absence um, and for the ways that, you know, these, so that there are all these absences and, and gaps in, in history and in our, all of our lives as well, um, that we, that we fill with, that we just fill, you know, it's like, it's like the gaps demand, demand stories or demand narrative and we can't, we can't help, you know, providing that and, and, and filling them in some ways. Um, so, but, but I was very struck by, I think, I think what happened when I was writing the book, um, and I didn't intend to, to write a book about loss originally, um, but I think what, what happened is, was that um, I started to, started to see that, you know, this, the sort of, this absence in, that absence that had happened in my own life because of these, because of the, these, the deaths of my sisters, you know, really corresponded to not just absences in other people's lives of the same type, but these like, you know, like large scale historical losses and traumas, I suppose, that, you know, things like, I mean, the biggest ones you can think of, like slavery and the Holocaust and whatever, whatever it might be. Um, but the, the, those are also, you know, they're these gaps which you don't know how to fill, like these gaps in history that you don't know how to fill, so they sort of operate like that. Um, but also that they're also made up of, all of these, all of these are just made up of these individual stories and individual losses as well. Um, even the sort of like the largest stories are also made up of all these individual ones. It's obvious. Right? Um, and in many cases, I mean, particularly with say, you know, Holo the, um, the Middle Passage, but also with with the Holocaust, um, there's just there's just um, there's actually so little so little known about about people's experiences in many ways. Even though people have written a lot um, around them, it's very hard to to actually understand what those experiences like, were like is virtually impossible. So they sort of demand speculation, you know? Um, they sort of, even though you're trying to write something which is non-fiction, it shades very quickly into sort of, into, you know, like a speculative narrative, into a sort of fictional narrative, even if it's grounded in, grounded in fact as much as you might want it to be. Well, and that kind of speculation would you which kind of unspools in various ways throughout the book in these in a, in a lot of unexpected and surprising ways. I feel like uh, digression might be frowned upon by some people, but I feel like this is a book of digression and it's a book of, of, of this kind of thought that that kind of sidles up to other things and moves along and you know and, and these stones which seem like these kind of monadal objects uh, that just are they exist right you know but in each of these stones there are stories and you you know, and you, as an anthropologist, you're not a geologist. You don't, uh, from what from what I understand, you don't have a training in geology, maybe. Yes. But so you learn this along the way. And so, how does it? How do you, as an anthropologist, approach um, uh, these stones? And and um, we'll talk about some of the specifics, yeah. specific stones themselves. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question. You know, when I when I wrote the, you know, like, like you said, you know, my my the last book before this one was was about insects, and I feel like that took a very insect form. You know, it was, it was, you know, lots and lots of different stories. They all seem to, many of them seem to like move very, move very fast. You know, they're all very different. Um, you know, and I was sort of overwhelmed by just the, by the, um, 
by sort of like the multitude of it all and trying to sort of control that. You know, stones are such different objects because they seem very, they seem very still and very contemplative. And then, and at first the book was very like that, but they're the kind of objects, and this way maybe they're similar to insects, that they sort of demand close attention. And then when you, when you do give them close attention, then your sense of scale changes. But with, with rocks, it's much more, or stone, it's much more sort of temporal scale. So, you know, the whole question of time just sort of like opened up with this book. And then every time I found like an, you know, like an object that I wanted to write about, it just seemed to sort of like open up more and more into different time periods and, you know, just sort of different, different moments. And these, the stone was sort of, you know, because the stone was sort of like travel, th travel through that it became, it was just like these, the, the sort of, like you're saying, the stories would just like open up and open up and open up. So it was the same problem in a lot of ways. A lot of the problems is like how to, you know, that, like narratively control that and make it manageable and coherent and readable, you know. Yeah. Um, One of the things that really struck me is that, is that just that movement uh, that stones move, stones migrate. And, and, you know, very often as you travel through the North, which I also want to ask a little bit about the North, because it's so rich in, in rock and stone. But you think about stones deposited by, by retreating glaciers or uh, blubber stone, which is, I think, your, your term that you coined mm -hmm. for a particular stone, which we'll definitely talk about a little bit. Um, but that kind of movement and, and the sort of paradoxical way, you know, I originally I thought, okay, from, you go from insects, which are these very transient and fast moving and, yeah. you know, things that we can overlook and, and stones of course we can overlook but I but I thought like this is like the other extreme of that and as, as you just said there is this kind of striking similarity and paradoxical similarity between the two um which it sounds like you discovered along the way as you were writing <laughs> I think so yeah and you know I think I've been lucky because because I've you know I like to write about things and maybe it's why books my books take me so long to write but I like to write about things that I know very very little about to start with and so then you know the the book, the the book is very much for me has has always been a very um, exploratory thing. You know, like I'm really trying to understand it and find out about it, and um, as I'm writing it. Um, so yeah, I started off. I knew very little about geology, very little about rocks, um, and so I was having really having to learn and understand just the that scale of thinking. Actually, was was a part of it, and just trying to get a sense of you know how to think on this you know, like planetary scale and actually on the scale of the universe and these, these like huge incomprehensible, you know, um, vistas of time as well. Um, but, but okay, I should tell you, I mean, this actually started with, a, with, with all this material, which, is, which never ended up in the book. Um, when I was writing Encyclopedia, part, one of the chapters was about um, cricket fighting in China and, um, you know, people who, who raised raised crickets and trained them trained them to fight and there's a lot of gambling and a lot of just a lot of expertise I and mean, people really communicate with, the, with these you know tiny insects and it's very fascinating and but while i was there i started to meet people who collected these um scholars rocks which maybe i'm sure you've seen them you know like people keep meeting often often in gardens larger ones or like in in their you know like on the desk or something like that and they you know for a lot of people there they're these like very contemplative objects, you know, they're sort of these very, very philosophical things, or they can be for people. And so, you know, when I talked to people, they talked about them in these very often people, not always, sometimes people are just very interested in, you know, how much, you know, how much they sell for and stuff like that. But people are also very interested in them sort of philosophically. So they, and there were these different ways. So for some people, it was this very sort of Confucian thing where the stone was like a model for a model for li for life. You know, it was it was it was strong and um, you know it was was withstand the you know like the the challenges of politics and ethics and whatever and be like this you know very solid solid moral upright upright thing which could be like a model for a person. And for other people, they were like these. You know, some people it was both, but for other people it would be like this. You know, this very sort of meditative object, which you would spend time with. You could, if you were, if you were sort of cultivated enough and elevated enough, you could sort of like lose your lose your person in and, and sort of dissolve yourself into this object and sort of transcend transcend your being through your relationship with with the stone. 
So none of that actually ended up in, in the book because the book, like you said, became much more about the North, but, but that, that became, you know, that, that started me in thinking about how to write about them as the, how to write about stones and how to, how to look at them and think about them in a way which I suppose wasn't geological in any way. But geology is still very important in terms of time, but it made me start to think about them as, you know, objects that you could sort of have a, have a relationship with and that were, you know, that, that meant a lot to people in, diff in different ways. Some ways, some, and some of these ways being very deep, you know, sort of had these, were very profound for people. Um, yeah. One of the um, kind of most remarkable to me examples in the book is, is the Odin stone. Um, which you visit, or I guess, which doesn't exist anymore, which was uh, has this whole whole history, um, yeah. and among the other stones, um, maybe let's see, I have, I mean, you know, and I think maybe one the longest chapter in the book maybe is the the Greenland chapter where you talk about the Cape York meteorite and the whole sort of history that accumulated around this. Um, some in some ways a very tragic history, in other ways, um, you know a human history in ways that, you know, are almost inevitably tragic, but also that expand our understanding of the world and our experience of the world in a way, um, as well as the megalithic stones that were buried in the Navabari. And, um, and so as you, it actually reminds me, so you probably know uh, Roger Cagliari's uh, writing of, of stones, that incredible book that is impossible to find yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, you can, you can find a, a PDF online, but there's a, uh, Marguerite Yersenar has in the introduction, sort of the closing of the introduction, it, it was in my mind as I read your book. Um, I'll just read it here, because I thought about this as I was reading yours. Okay. She writes that stones like us stand at the intersection of countless lines crossing one another and receding to infinity, at the center of a field of forces too unpredictable to be measured. And we awkwardly call the result chance, hazard, or fate. Uh, it feels like, the, to me, that that could be an epigraph for your book, another epigraph for your book where, where the stone, you know, becomes this leaping off point. Um, both the stones move and the world moves around the stones, of course. Um, and so some of the stories that you, that you uncovered along the way, you know, as you're training as an anthropologist through talking to people, but also the deep research that you must have done, you know, in the 10 years that you were writing this, it's, mm -hmm. it comes through, um, it feels fresh and vital and alive. Um, and so I, you know, maybe just pick, is there a particular moment that you feel really kind of crystallized things for you in the writing of the book about how things tie together? Uh, oh, that's another really good question. I mean, the thing, yeah, let me think how to answer that. I have to tell you, you know, having spent so long over the book, the book changed an awful lot. So there's a chapter in there in the middle about, about Iceland. Um, and I could read a little bit from that. Maybe, maybe later. Okay. good time to read that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. think so? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, we we had talked before we we came on, and and Hugh mentioned a, a passage, and he mentioned a page number, and I held up my book and said, I I have a, a piece of paper sticking out of that page. It's a incredible passage. So I'm glad that we get to hear this. <laughs> okay, that's great. So I should I should say by way of introduction, this is um this is a chapter about Iceland, and it's um. Well, something something happened while I was there that I described that I describe in this section, and that was really crucial to the book. Um, but I'll read this. I'll read this, and then um, then the chapter is built around around this around this incident. So it is um, at this point. It is it is winter. It's January, um, so it gets dark. You know the days are very short, maybe like four or five hours, um, and a lot of it is a sort of twilight. But it gets, but it gets dark. Um, yeah, it gets dark. I don't know, like four o'clock, three o'clock, something like that, um, in the afternoon. And um, this is at a beach, um, a stone beach, which is quite, quite a, re quite a remote place. It felt quite remote, um, and because it's winter and um, because it's winter, there's not very, there's actually nobody, nobody around. Okay. So, the creaking of the ice stretching in the pond drew me across the wreck strewn beach, and I stooped to pick up a large rectangular black stone. The stone was heavier than I expected, denser, colder, and harder than it looked. I held it, touched its smoothness, felt its cold and 
and hardness, imagined it on the polished wooden ledge by my window on 91st Street, alongside other stones from other places, not so much a map of the world as the world itself. Snowflake obsidian from Arizona, Lingby limestone from Anhui, desert rose gypsum from Niger, leech coral, fi leech coral filaments from the Florida Keys, gleaming obsidian from the ancient quarry fields of Milos, and a small block of grayish marble from northern Manhattan. Mauve sky on a hot summer evening, the songs of birds and crickets, children running, stooping, drawn to that pale soft, pale soft stone. Black, black stone, blue, green ice. That pond is thought to be bottomless, to fall into infinity. I took out my phone and recorded the ice stretching, the breathy beating of the wind like a flock of panicked birds, wings battering the mic, and then a sudden crack like a gunshot followed by a drawn out splash as if a giant glacier were carving into the frigid water as, at that moment, somewhere on that vast northern ocean, one undoubtedly was. And then, back in the car, nothing worked. The red door open icon lit angrily on the dashboard and a shrieking, nerve-jangling metallic alarm invaded all that bleak, black, wide open shorescape, overwhelming all other sound, the wind, the ice, the ocean, and scaring the seabirds to wheel off high into the gray. Darkness was falling. There were no other people for miles. It was far to a paved road. I checked the doors. I checked them again. I opened and closed them multiple times. Unsure what to do, I started the engine and warily drove away. But the alarm only grew louder and the light flashed ever more aggressively. After a few hundred yards, it became too much and I stopped in the middle of the lava field, got out of the car, and took the beautiful, cold, rectangular black stone that didn't want to go to New York, but from which I didn't want to part, took it from the passenger seat and placed it carefully beside the unpaved road. And then I closed the door and held my breath and started the engine and drove away, slowly and in perfect silence. I get the chills when you when I... <laughs> um... And so one of the, one of the, you quote uh, Marcia, Marcia Eliade in the book oh. where, where, where he writes, uh, above all stone is, and of course that could be a statement in of itself, but it also just leaves that is floating there. And yeah. you can fill in, you can fill in what stone is. And I think in a lot of ways, stone proves to be stubborn or more transient. Or, and in this case, it, it was, it was stubborn. And, um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, your I mean, these are relationships, right? These are these are relationships with non-human objects, with what is what, he, what seems to be the, the least human object. Um, but you kind of imbue these these stones not in, in an anthropomorphic way, um, but you you embed stories within these. And and I think this experience. Can you tell us how this sort of focus things for you in a way? Yeah, because I think it made me, okay, so, so it was real. I mean, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating any of that. That's exactly what happened. And I told people who I knew and all people who lived there who I knew, Icelandic people, and they were just like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and I was like, well, not really, of course, you know, they were like, yeah, really, of course, that's just like, that's normal. And then they would tell me other stories of like other things, some of which were about stones, others, you know, were about things like, I don't know, like, um, you know, um, kettles, you know, like somebody had like a water, you know, like a water kettle for making, making tea and it just boiled itself. Nobody turned it on it, you know, and they, he and his dad were standing there and they wanted to, you know, they were, and his dad said, sure, he has some tea. And at that point, the kettle boiled and neither of them had turned it on. You know, these kind of stories, and they were like parallel. And that really, that really made me think, I mean, it made me think about objects and the, but also just how there's so much in life that we're just, you know, we, we sort of go through life as if the world that we see and understand is the, and I interact with is just the world that is, but it, this started to make me think well about all these dimensions that I'm, you know, that we're all there with, but we don't recognize or think seriously about, or, you know, maybe at some level we know that there's, you know, we don't really, there are dimensions to the world that we don't, that we're not, that we don't understand. 
and we sort of accept they're out there. But then when if you actually, you know, and experiences like that and actually spending a lot of time with stones in general made me really think about, uh, yeah, so hard to express this. I suppose the sort of, at some level, the sort of like superficiality of the way that we, of the way that we move, move through the world. Um, and I know that's incredibly vague, but, and it operates in different ways. So one of the obvious ways is, is through time that, you know, the time that, the time that we have at some, at some level is so, is so tiny. You know, we, I don't know what it would be, anything from whatever, you know, a human life. It's like, it's so insignificant at some level. Um, and we know that, but we still operate, you know, it's still incredibly meaningful to us. So we, we constantly, we, we always operate, I think, on at least two levels, but certainly on these two levels simultaneously. Like one is sort of like this cosmic level of, you know, that we're part of the way that the world moves. And, you know, and in that sense, we are, we are sort of entirely in sync and attuned with things like rocks and trees and whatever it might, whatever it might be. But in the other, we live this completely different life where, you know, when somebody we know dies, we know in some ways that that's like part of the universe and part of life, but we're also devastated by it. So, you know, we, we're having to sort of like live between and both of those things at, both of those things at once somehow. And it's, you know, they don't, they can't, they, they never fit together, but in some ways I feel like, or at least writing this book, it really felt like a lot of what I was trying to do was, was think through that and trying to figure out how to live with that. So one of the strategies, I mean, like personal strategies for coming to terms with that was just seeing how, you know, the sort of that experience of, of loss sort of personally, yeah, like a personal loss was, it's so fundamental and so generalized, you know, and sort of exists in every, you know, I mean, everybody has experienced that. I and mean, that's one of the things, the longer you live, the more you experience it. Um, so it was just sort of trying to make sense of that at the same time as trying to make sense of the sort of like the cosmic dimensions of life, I guess, for one of a better way of putting it. Yeah. So it's not like it's resolvable, you know, it's not like a book like this is ever going to resolve that or to find a way to think about it. It just creates a space that you can sort of spend, I think, this is how I think of it, it sort of like creates the space where you can spend time with that and think about it for yourself. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like, it's not like it's giving you an answer or something. Yeah, well, and part of the part of what I was before we we came on, I was saying that this book. There have been a few books throughout the sort of COVID months that have really seemed to speak right to the moment without actually speaking specifically to the moment. And I think your the reflections on time in the book are, are, are particularly that way. You a couple of quotes that I jotted down from. Uh, you write at one point the fragile time we take uh, to be the safety of the everyday. And then there's there's deep time and, and there's kind of this paradox with deep time as well. The time is both immeasurably deep and inexplicably shallow, which I think kind of create cause, you know, that's the friction between time, which almost moves geologically of its own, on its own, right? I mean, we're all experiencing that these days where one day to the yeah, next. I know. Feels, it's incredible. Right? I know. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you do it in, in no sort of heavy handed way, which I really admire. There's no it doesn't feel ever that you're trying to make this point. It's actually through, almost through case studies, um, you know, and your, I assume your training as an anthropologist kind of lends itself to that, that there, there, are, there aren't sort of abstractions, um, which I feel would be, would be very easy to do when writing a book about, uh, about, you know, ostensibly about stones would be to sort of abstract into deep time. Yeah. This book is so yeah. concrete, um, and here we are. I'm here. I am like using these <laughs> these hard metaphors. You know, you you can't avoid it. Um, yeah. But you know, was that just a strategy, or did is that just inherent to to you as a writer to to be as ab to be as concrete as possible? You know, I think it, I think it is, but it's also I, I suppose it's the way that my mind works as well. Um, you know, I'm interested in philosophical questions, but I'm interested in thinking through in a very concrete way. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny, even though what I've said maybe sounds, I mean, I, in some ways I don't really like vagueness, even though it's not, I don't expect explanations and solutions. Do you know what I mean? I think that sounds, maybe that sounds contradictory, I don't know. But, but I guess I, I really like to think through and explore things through 
concrete, yeah, like you say, concrete examples, and also through narrative and story. That's really important to me. So, and yeah, I think I think that's right. But I don't. Ex I, I suppose I don't expect those things to be. I don't set stories to be simple, because I don't think life is. You know, so a lot of these stories are extremely complicated, and and I sort of hope the reader will go will go with them because in some ways that complication is the point of them. You know, like following all the ins and outs of them to see what happens and, and how people try to make sense of them and how they were of the situation um, and is, is sort of the point of the stories. But, and that's, yeah, I think it's to, yeah, the way I've come, the way I've come to think about it is that, you know, is that you know through narrative you can you can sort of like open up open up a world where a reader can or certain kinds of narrative you open up a world where that where, where a reader can sort of inhabit that world and sort of experience those experience the challenges through being inside being inside the book and for me that's that's often through detail so it is very very concrete whereas I think if I tried to write the same kind of thing in an in an abstract way it wouldn't have that effect it wouldn't have that that effect for the reader it would be a more sort of not necessarily, I mean, it depends, but for me, I think the way that I would write, it would be a more distance kind of relationship and people would be sort of in a more sort of assessing kind of relationship with the text. Well, does this make sense? Does this not make sense? Whereas what I want them to have is a more sort of like the experience you would have with immersive fiction or something like that, where you're inside it and try, and it's yeah, much more like an experience. And so you're trying to figure out how you would relate to the situation and to the people who are going through it themselves. You know, that, that kind of a more, yeah experiential, I guess, so that, that would be. Well, the book has an atmosphere. Uh, uh, it, it reads as if it's a, a novel in some ways. You know, these stories that you tell are these stories and, and not not a lot of nonfiction, I feel like, can, can kind of straddle those worlds and kind of contain that kind of energy. And and so maybe, you know, I'm maybe I'm being too abstract now. Like, so what are some of the stories? You know, along the way in the book, I was surprised suddenly there's Robert Peary and there's Matthew Henson. And that whole story is a really intriguing one with- Really, really intriguing. Yeah, really intriguing. Um, and that's a story about, that starts with these meteorites, which are in the Museum of Natural History, which is not far from here in, in New York. Um, and they're very, very large. Well, one of them particularly is huge. It's, I think, the second or third largest that's ever been found. And it's the story of how, basically, how that ended up in the museum. And, you know, it was brought there by Robert Peary in 1897. And Peary was a, you know, he was a very, at the time, very well-known Arctic explorer, adventurer. Um, he was a very, very much sort of also sort of a showman. You know, I mean, he, he was extremely adept at um you know self-promotion self public publicizing you know and, and getting rich people to give him money he was really 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 good at that um but he but it but it was also because he was very very obsessed with going going to the arctic and you know he really had this sense of himself as the sort of like he wanted to be a great arctic explorer i think um and he certainly wanted to be the first the first man at the North Pole, and he wanted to be the first white man at the North Pole. That was very important um, for him. Um, but um, he, so so he had this relationship with the museum, and he was going through a time. And and in order to you know keep getting money, he had to keep you know coming back with stuff. And so you know he heard about he'd heard about these meteorites which were in Northwest Greenland. And he'd heard about them because an earlier British um, British voyage had, um, and it was the first to come in contact. Um, the first, they were the first Europeans who had met people who lived there. Um, I don't want to say these people were sort of uncontacted, uncontacted or something. They had a very complicated life of traveling and trading, and you know, a full a full life of where they were, you know, involved in society in Northwest Greenland. Um, but it was the first time Europeans had come in contact with them. Um, and they they were really surprised to see that people had metal, they had iron. And so they wrote about that and they figured out these, um, they, the, they, when they came back, they, they, they wrote in their reports that, you know, there was, I mean, what they really found there was, was whales, I think was what they were most interested in, but they also found that there were um, 
they had oil, um, they had iron. And they figured out that it came from meteorites. Piri then became very obsessed with getting these meteorites at this, at this moment when he was just really short of funds. So he went there and on that ship, he'd also been asked by Franz Boas, who was, you know, really the, not yet, but would become, I suppose, you know, he's often called something like the founding father of professional, professional anthropology, American anthropology, he became this very, very important figure. Um, Boris's work was an assistant curator at the Museum of Natural History at the time. Piri had this relationship with the museum, and Boris asked him if he would bring back one, he was quite specific, he wanted a um, adult male, adult male um, Inuit from Northwest Greenland. And the idea was that he was, you know, they were doing this all over the, mostly in the US. Um, they were trying to find um, American Indians, um, Native Americans, who they could, you know, who they could collect language from because they felt like, you know, the Santa Paul just the time. They were, they were really, really convinced that, that these indigenous cultures would disappear. Indigenous people would disappear. And there's good reason to think that because of what was happening to people in the United States. You know, they were under incredible pressure um, from, you know, the Indian codes and from various other, various other very, very repressive um, government legislation, you know, so people couldn't practice their religion, they couldn't use the languages or so. So anthropologists were going out on this sort of like salvage mission to, if they couldn't protect save people, then what they wanted was to like, you know, document their culture. That's what they were trying to do. So Boas wanted period to bring back, bring back, you know, this this guy, any 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 guy from Northwest Greenland who could, you know, who would, you know, be able to speak speak this language and would be able to tell them all about their, you know, material culture and their uh, you know, like fishing techniques and all this kind of stuff. But Piri, because Piri was sort of like this guy who just would always go, you know, like several steps beyond if he, if he could, brought back six people. The museum had no idea what to do with him. And I should say, because it's the story is often told like that, that he just like kidnapped these people and brought them back. And people in Greenland sometimes tell it like that too. But actually, I think it's probably more accurate to think of it that you know people people in people there had seen Europeans coming and they were really interested to know what life was like in life was like in Europe or in the US. They really wanted to know, you know, what's where these people were coming from and what was what was going on. And they were also people who were used to traveling, at least within the Arctic. So I think it was also, you know, an opportunity for them to come and, you know, they were you know, Perry told them they'd come for a summer and then he'd bring them back. Because that was also Boris's plan. But when people got here, when these six people got there, and it was four adults, one teenage girl, and then a young boy who was like seven or eight at the time. When they got there, the museum had no idea what to do with them. So first of all, they were put in a basement, like a basement room. And you know, visitors to the museum were quickly got out because Piri had really, really publicized it. And so it had thousands of people come to meet the ship um, when it came back to see the meteorites and to see these people. And um, so people got sick very, very fast and it was over, very overheated um, quarters. Um, they started getting flu and stuff like that. They were moved. I tell the whole story, it gets quite, it's, you know, the details of it are very, very interesting. Four people died, four people died, three people died really fast. Four people died really fast within a, within a couple of months. Um, one managed to, one of the adult men managed to get himself back to Greenland. But never really settled there again because people didn't believe the stories that he told. So he was just known as he was actually known as you know like the big liar, because people wouldn't accept all the stuff about the buildings and whatever that he told. Um, and he died young, and then this young boy Minnick, who was there, he lived for. 10 or 15 years and in the end died sort of homeless and it's a very, very tragic story. And anyway, none of the story, none of the story appears in, in the meteorites. You know, the meteorites are there in the museum as meteorites. The story just doesn't, isn't there at all. The four people who died in the, in here in, in New York, um, eventually in I think 1993, you know, which is nearly a hundred years later, the museum repatriated their bodies because people wanted them back and had a burial ceremony. 
And, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with that. You know, and this is tied into all these demands for repatriation of, of objects and all kinds of stuff, which is going on at the moment with, with museums as well. Um, this is a very long version of the story I'm telling you, I'm sorry. Um, no, but, it's, yeah. No, I was gonna say, yeah, it brings to mind, you know, that I think the Museum of Natural History says that the, the meteorite was collected, um, you know, which is sort of a euphemistic term for, for what happened. But it, maybe it actually leads to, a, we have a question here from uh, Mary Ann who, who asks that um, traditional indigenous cultures do understand uh, that other than human are our teachers that we're in relationship with others. As an anthropologist, did any of this traditional understanding of our world inform your experience in writing the book? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, it's a really good question. Um, and I'd say yes, I think that the ways that I came to, or that I've come to think of, um, well, well, I've always been sympathetic to thinking about other than humans. This is probably clear from the way that I've been talking as well. Um, and, but I hadn't really thought particularly about, about, rocks and stones and I think I learned a lot from from writing this book just from talking to people um, who I think just you know one of my strategies is to talk to people who've thought about these things for a lot longer and a lot deeper than I have and to really try to listen to them and I think learn from learn from people as well um, so yeah I mean I don't think I could give you any specific examples of ways in which that ways in which that happened apart from the ones I said at the beginning with people in China um, but and I suppose but but no actually I say this a lot I think probably everywhere that I went that happened I mean in Iceland that certainly happened as well by the way you know the ways people would talk about landscape was very different from the way that I would talk about it or think about it so listening to them and just having to and then having an experience where in a way it's like you know, you sort of feel like, well, okay, this landscape is telling me that I have to think about it differently from the way that I was doing. So, yeah, I think that part of spending such a long time thinking about one type of object is that your relationship to it really changes. And so I guess in some ways, for me anyway, become much more open to, you know, to hearing about the ways and listening to how people people who thought about it longer and in different ways from me have thought about it. Um, yeah, of course, and I think you, or well, speaking for myself anyway, come out of a project like this different from the way that you come into it, go into it. And I suppose that's part of the point of, part of the point of doing it as well. And then the book is trying to communicate that. Um, you know, sometimes though, people don't, people don't necessarily even want to, want to talk about things in those terms. It's like they're not necessarily interested in changing the way that I ever think about something. They might have other things that they would want to talk to me about. So like, for instance, in, in Greenland, little people, I think, do have very different ways of thinking about, about nature from the way that I would think about it, and particularly about, particularly about ice and the seasons and animals from the way that I would. People... You know, when I when I was there, I think people were really preoccupied with other with other questions. You know, they're more preoccupied with questions of, um, and I, I went to talk about those kinds of things. That's what I wanted to do. But people really wanted to talk about things like, you know, being displaced from um, where they've been able to hunt before, um, and partly they've been displaced from them because of um, quotas that have been placed on the on that have been put on. Um, you know, so animals they could hunt, which had been, which were conservation quotas, but which meant that they couldn't hunt the animals that they wanted to hunt or had been used to hunting, which meant they were really having to, you know, reimagine what their lives would be like because they could no longer, were no longer able to basically live off the land in the same way. Um, they wanted to talk about being evicted from um, villages and settlements that they'd been in before. They wanted to talk about poverty because they felt like they were didn't weren't able to get political representation in the Greenlandic Parliament and things like that. So those were the, those are the things that people were that were really, you know, important for people to talk about. And that's you know that's in the context of having a different relationship with nature and thinking about nature differently. I think, but but you know in a way that that was sort of just like background to the way that people were living. It was interesting, right? I mean, I think you sort of learn a lot, learn a lot from yeah. And, yeah. 
conversations, you know, and we, we haven't had a, really had a chance to talk about the North as we kind of wind down here, but, yes. but, but something that is, is very apparent is sort of the history of extraction in the North. I mean, and somewhere in the book, you, you write that this is a landscape. Europeans came to this landscape and they extracted everything they could from it, basically, right? They just pulled everything out. And, you know, of course now, you know, Greenlanders are, you know, have quotas on what they can hunt, you know, and this is the consequence of over, over hunting, over fishing, whatever. But, and so I, you know, I, I you as an anthropologist, I, you know, when you went there, you know, very much so you're, you're going for stories and you're going to experience, but you're, you know, you're going there as a human being. And so how do you kind of navigate that? You know, that you're just not another white man going to extract something from. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you know, again, this is another this is another great question. And this is this has become a huge issue. I mean, I think it always has been, but it's recently become a huge issue in anthropology as well. Um, you know, what what kind of relationship is that and how do you avoid it being an extractive relationship? And it's something that, you know, I absolutely struggle with all the time. Um, and I really would like to be able to give you a really good answer for that. I don't think I, I don't think I have one. In some ways, I think it's built into the built into the logic of going somewhere and writing about it. And then, you know, the benefits of what I'm writing accrue primarily to, primarily to me. Um, and then the things that I could say, I'm not even sure that I believe in deeply at this point, which are that, you know, it's, you know, the experience of being able to talk about things is something that people often want to do, they often want to have the, that experience of talking to someone, but you know, often in certain places, people have had that experience many times, and at this point, it's just sort of routine. Um, that people, you know, that, that you know, the book, the book circulates, and the book writes about people in a way that they maybe haven't been written about in other ways, and puts them in a context that in at other times, and puts them in a context that might they might not have been um, put in before. Um, I think the answers are really weak, actually. I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that I, if I'm being really honest about it, which I try to be. So I think, okay, so let me, let me put it this way. In this book, and this is something that I've, you know, sort of tried to make sense of over, over my whole career. Um, I think in this book, the, I try to choose places where that that wasn't a the ethical problem that that presents wasn't wasn't so much of it wasn't I guess I would say isn't wasn't a yeah I guess I would say wasn't an urgent problem so I wrote about New York as a as somebody who's lived here for a very long time I wrote about Svalbard which is where everybody who lives there at this point is pretty much. I mean, some people have lived there a long time, but everywhere who's lived there, everybody who lives there lives there to some extent is a visitor. Um, you know, the average amount of time that people live there is two to six years, something like that. And everybody is trying to navigate navigate the, that place and figure out how to how to make a life in it. Um, that the place that was the most complicated from this point of view was Greenland. And I have, you know, I, and I, I'm not sure how I feel about, it. I tried to write about it in a way which foregrounded questions that were really important to people who lived there. So these questions of the eviction, the question of repatriation of, of objects, um, question of the sort of like political relationship that people have with Greenland as a whole, and to try to make the, make that chapter more about the museum and the responsibility of people in New York and the United States and in in museums to their objects and to the history of the objects. That was really what the focus of the chapter was. But there's still this issue that part of what part of what the, makes that possible in that chapter is writing about people in Greenland and placing them you know, sort of in this, placing them in the book in a way that then opens up that question of what's missing in the museum. So, you know, and that's, but I guess my solution to that, the problem which I think I don't know how to resolve was to sort of displace it and make the question, the question about, about inequality in 
in museums and in collecting and to open up the question of collecting more than make it a make it a chapter about oh look how these people live and look what they do yeah. you know so I guess that would be that would be my answer but but honestly you know quite honestly I don't know that I know how to answer it any other way in terms of going somewhere and I sort of feel like it's something I don't want to do anymore I'm sort of like easing my way out of it in that way and this book is sort of like my easing my way out of it compared to the last book and the, and the one before you know well, I say that, that the Greenland chapter in particular, you know, it's so much of the story of, of Robert Peary and, and Matthew Henson, and, and it, it comes, of course, from research, historical research, but it also comes from living people there who, who you know, there's a there's a cultural memory of these events and, and things, which I was really struck by, that, that, that not that you gave them voice, but that you let them tell those stories, and so I found that really, not beyond refreshing, but, but sort of, it, it honored it honored something that I think could easily be glossed over. It could easily have been, this could easily have been a research book, right? You could have, you could have told many of these stories without being on the ground even, you know, in these places and, and sort of talking to people. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, right. glad, I'm glad it came across that way. I mean, I, I hope it does. You know, and people, people there read it and gave me comments on it, on that chapter. And, you know, I incorporated those, those comments, um, which is something that I always do when I write about um, with people who are in the book or in, the, in a book. Yeah, I think it's it's. I think this is a really um, complicated, difficult thing. But yeah, but the that's yeah. The way you put it is way better than the way that I put it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, I thank you for it. And, um, and so, as we kind of wind down, if anyone else has, has, has any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat or in the question box. But maybe you can. Was there one, is there, you collect stones as well. Mm. Um, and it was there, you, I, you know, it's funny because I'm, I look up and I, have, I don't even, I just have a stone above me on my bookshelf here that just looks like a burger. This is like, it really, <laughs> what is it? I don't, Where did it come from? here you go, there's the top. But so, so talk about maybe as we kind of conclude here, is there, you know, your and there's a passage which I, I won't be able to find now is on one of my sheets of paper here but you kind of talk about the collection um your collection and you know things that catch your eye and and how much of it is something that just catches your eye and then how much of it is this is it as you said the the uh the stories that that attach to these stones can you can you, maybe I can, I can rephrase it in a more specific way like is, it, is a stone to you just a an aesthetic object a stone that you collect is it just an aesthetic object can it be for you yeah it can be but you know then it never really is is it because because you know it has some it has all this life and history and you know everything about it and you don't really know what it's you don't really know what it is so it's like so completely mysterious you know i mean yeah, yeah. but i can show you one that i i do really like so this because this has a practical this has a practical story um, this is basalt. Um, it's kind of basalt, but these are these are stones that people use to break off break off pieces of the meteorite in, in Greenland. So um, they people collected these and brought them from some distance away, and then they would bring them because they were hard. They were like one of the few things which was hard enough to to break iron off the meteorite. So when you go to where the meteorite is. Um, or was before Perry took it. Um, a couple of them are just surrounded by piles and piles of these stones that people had used over over a long time. I mean, those, I mean, hundreds of years, you know, to do that. Um, but now, you know, there's just a big hole in the ground, or three big holes in the ground. Where yeah. were, and then these, yeah. Well, that struck me too, that, that, that the meteorite wasn't, necessarily sort of an object of veneration. This was a practical, I mean, this was a windfall, right? <laughs> this was yeah, a, exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, um, well, um, I don't know, let's see, Isaac. Um, no, Isaac mentioned the Duchamp's analog uh, of bottling the air in Paris, um, mm -hmm. only because of enclosure, um, which, yeah, you know, these, these stones taken from their their context, you know, like someone could pick up a stone that you just found up somewhere else and have no uh, idea that it was used as a, yeah. Yeah, and I thought, I mean, that was really the, that was, to me, that was the, you know, that was the message from the, the stone in Iceland. It was like, you know, 
what are you doing taking me, put me back, you know? I mean, really, that was, it really felt like that. It was like, you know, just don't, <laughs> just don't. So since then, I've been really, really, you know, I'm always picking them up and I'm like, mm, no, I don't think so, you know? Yeah. So. Well, you, know. you, thank you so much for this. I, like I said, I, this book has lived with me in, in part to come back and I've reread sections of it now and, um, I also want to compliment you as a writer on your use of lists. You are an amazing list writer. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> not an easy thing to pull off. Um, I some of the catalogs that you kind of create and and um, beyond you know, beyond the, the writing of the book itself, those kind of stood out to me and and just the ground you covered. And I do think you know, as, as I said, I think there's a lot of respect and and sort of um, and you're you're tuned in a way um, to the to the world that I think we could all benefit from and that I certainly did by reading this book. Um, well, so thank you. Thank you. Very thank you. Us. And um, I'll look forward to wherever you go next. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah. Um, but, but thank you very much. It's been it really been, it's been great to talk. Thank you, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And um, thanks everyone else for showing up tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Again, the, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen. You can buy the book. Um, I see many people here. I know I've already, I've processed your orders myself. So I know that the book is making its way out into the world. And as a bookseller, this is the kind of book that I that I love to be able to sell because it's a book that's a conversation piece. And, that I can't just say this is a book about stones. I have to explain and talk about it. And, um, oh, that's and, great. You know, and in these days, you know, where we're, we're, like, we're, we're having so few conversations face to face and with the bookstore open again, I get to have these conversations with people and it's even more fodder for human connection in a way. So, you know, from my point of view, you know, you spend all this time writing a book and you have no idea what's going to happen when it goes out into the world, you know, or if anybody's even going to notice it or read it. So, you know, like apart from, you know, like your close friends. So yeah. it's really, it's it's very special to know that, you know, people are reading it and to hear this from you. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll keep, I'll keep doing what I can do for it. And, um, and someday come back to California and we'll, uh, we'll do this in person. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. I'd love that. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you again. And um, good night and uh, good night you. And um, well, we'll see you all again someday. Thanks. Bye everybody.